Hello and uh, welcome to this session which uh, will deal with the Good Friday Agreement, a complex agreement created to deal with the complexities of the intercommunal realities of Northern Ireland. Uh, Northern Ireland is, is usually described as a state or a statelet, but in actual fact it was an artificial administrative unit created for a variety of reasons, uh, not least to, to please the, uh, the minority. And for that reason, elections were a bit superfluous. There were plebiscites on the border. And uh, in relation to class uh, conflict or class alliances, it was particularly difficult, especially after Lord Brookbra introduced the step-by-step -step policy of the Unionist Party. Uh, given the, um, the nature of these realities and the, the political violence of the 30 years preceding the agreement, it could be said that the GFA was a triumph of the will over the then widespread despair. 25 years on, the agreement remains a topical subject. We have uh, uh, Brexit and we've got the DUP, as usual, playing political games. So the future of the agreement is perhaps problematic. So what does the future hold for the agreement? Have we reason to be optimistic? Our speakers will undoubtedly provide stimulating presentations on the subject from a uniquely trade union perspective. I'm going to introduce both of them now in order to save a bit of time so we, maybe we can squeeze in a few more questions. We have Patricia McKeown, a former president of the ICTU and chairman of the Northern Ireland Committee. And uh, we have a substitute in the form of Jerry McCormick, uh, the Deputy General Secretary of, of SIP2. Unfortunately, Joe Cunningham uh, was unable to attend for uh, union uh, purposes. So, as with well, other sessions, uh, there will be some time after the presentations for some questions. We'll ask you to be brief either in the questions or in the uh, observations. Before I ask the fourth speaker, I would like to take the opportunity to thank the Department of Tourism, Culture, Arts, Guild Talk, Sport and Media and all the other sponsors for the support they give to this conference. Patricia. Thanks very much, Bill. Um, when, uh Jack McGinley talked to me into saying yes to this some months ago. He didn't, uh, he didn't share with me the full title. The peace process, the Good Friday Agreement, Brexit trade negotiations. So I was thinking to myself, what do we want here? Do we want the past eight years of Brexit? When um, we, as a union, with allies, because we've always worked with allies, went to Washington and said to the chair of the Ways and Means Committee and Speaker Pelosi and the Ad Hoc Committee on the Good Friday Agreement, if you believe in the Good Friday Agreement, no trade agreement with the UK unless we have guarantees. And then went to Europe and said the same thing to Sef Sefcovic and for the last number of years have been in continual dialogue with our allies in both parts of this island, with the Irish government and still with the US to try and hold them to that position. Or the past 25 years of the, of the peace process, the peace agreement, 25 years old, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, 25 years seeking implementation because promises were made about a better life for the people we represent. Or the past 50 years of conflict, profound impact on everybody in our society and on how we organized as trade unions over the past hundred years where this problem started. I'm going to start with the here and now and I'll wind backwards and then come to the present day again but the here and now is a difficult position. Two weeks ago British government as only it can removed the rights of victims and survivors of the conflict to a hearing and to justice argued that uh, they were dying out, spectacularly forgetting that they had relatives, children, 
grandchildren, people who remember history, community history, people who will not accept this position and they've done it simply because they want to safeguard their own impunity. But what they've done is really quite remarkable because in, in this position we find ourselves in we, where we are desperately searching for political consensus to move things forward, we find that on this issue we had absolute unanimity from all of our elected politicians and political parties. They opposed that legislation. The victims and survivors of the conflict, one voice, they opposed that legislation. The Irish Congress of Trade Unions unanimously opposed that legislation. Society as a whole in the North opposes that legislation. So as only the British government can do, they ignored all of that and said, tough, we're going to do it our way. That, uh, that brings us to the fact that we've been celebrating, marking, backslapping 25 years of the peace agreement. It was a big event, three day event at Queen's University. We were um, up to our necks in former US presidents, former Irish Taoiseachs, former British prime ministers, all sorts of people talking about the heroic roles they had played in getting a peace agreement into place. Absent, the Irish trade union movement. No formal invite to the Irish Congress of Trade Unions, no formal invite to any trade union. I was there with a colleague from my union, courtesy of a human rights lawyer in the human rights department at Queen's University. Jim McCusker, a former president of the Irish Congress, he was there via another route. Uh, Michael Smith, the president of FORSA, he was there um, via a completely other route too. None of us had been invited as trade unionists or trade union leaders. And that says something about the mindset of what is the establishment in the North that has not significantly changed, not over the past 25 years, probably not over the past 100. I want to put all of this in a context. I live in a divided city. We still have 70 separation walls in Belfast. I live in the north of the city where the majority of separation walls are. And these days those walls mark territory and they confine mindsets. And our mission as trade unionists over the past 35 years, 40 years, has been to turn that around, change those mindsets, try and create a better society, and to have our movement in the forefront as an agent of change. And none of that work has been particularly easy. Back in the early 80s, I went to work for a tiny part of a big GB-based union. It's called NUPE, National Union of Public Employees. And it found itself with a few members in the north, um, more by accident than design. But to its credit, it tried to make some sense of that. And a couple of years later, it appointed the first ever woman organizer it had ever appointed, shamefully, in a union that was majority female. And that was Ines McCormick and uh, it was safe for them to do that because she was on the other side of the Irish Sea. And uh, a couple of years later, they appointed a second woman organizer and that was me. And a couple of years after that, there was a two page spread in the Guardian newspaper about a woman who would go on to be one of the leading lights in the uh, British political party, the SDP. It was about this woman who'd just been appointed by our union as his first ever woman organizer. We sent a very simple note to the editor of The Guardian. But to his credit, he, he printed it, and it said, she's not the first woman. There are two of us over here, but we're Irish. That's always said they printed it. But it was an indication of where the place I live in, the people in it, 
are on anybody's agenda. Because the truth of the matter is, we have not been on the top of the UK government's agenda, except for maybe one brief period, around the 98 period, 97, 98. We have not been at the top of the Irish government's agenda. We're not even at the top of our own most of the time. Back then in the early 80s, we set about trying to grow that tiny union and we decided that the best thing to do would be go after the most marginalized workers who were not unionized. And in our society, those were predominantly women workers, part-time workers, very low paid men. Um, we were a public service union, so we were looking at school news workers, school cleaners, hospital domestics, porters, home helps, thousands and thousands of them, with absolutely no rights whatsoever. We were also trying to organize them during a conflict, and that meant that we had to adjust how we did our business, because there was only one way to organize, and that was go to where they were, meet them, talk to them, convince them. A number of things informed the strategy we employed then and still employ today. First, our feminism. I work for a part of a union, which is the only union on this island that has been led by women for 43 years. It won't always be like that, but that has been significant. Second thing that informed our strategy was that direct engagement with our members. Over the years, we have had direct engagement with tens of thousands of members. In the early days, we heard criticism from other people in the movement who said, why are you wasting your energy in this thing you call participative democracy? The place for the trade union movement is inside the corridors of power. That's where we're gonna make a difference. That form of engagement we established back then held us in great stead in 1998 when our members were asked to support the Good Friday Agreement and it held us in great stead in 2016 when we encouraged our members to vote against Brexit. Our other key strategic issue was work with allies. We could not have ever succeeded in the work that we were doing without the support of allies, community-based organizations, and across this island, north and south, the NGOs working in equality and human rights. We've worked with them for 40 years now. Back in 96, 97, in the north with our, our partner, the Committee on the Administration of Justice, the human rights NGO, we established an equality coalition, an equality coalition that would start to frame demands as to what should be in our peace agreement around equality and human rights and what would be in the subsequent 1998 legislation. Um, we brought into that coalition the areas, the, the groups protect in the protected legislation, women, women's organizations, uh, the LNG community as it was at that stage, uh, uh, the disability, people with disabilities. Um, we, we brought in um, the very small emerging organizations uh, supporting the growing black and uh, migrant workers in the north. And we widened the scope of that. We brought in representatives of the Republican and Loyalist communities as one way of looking at where we were on fair employment, religious discrimination, discrimination on the basis of uh, political opinion. Um, and that small grouping has steadfastly grown over the last three decades to become an organization of more than 100 organizations 100 organizations in the north dedicated to the pursuit of equality and human rights and uh, a set of organizations who on the whole um, don't take nonsense from anybody and that kind of a strategy has shaped who and what we are in the early days in the 
formal trade union movement, you'd be surprised to know in this part of the 21st century that we weren't always on the same page as the leadership of our movement. We were bringing difficult issues to the trade union agenda. Um, rights for part-time workers, could you believe it was controversial? Uh, rape within marriage, contraceptive and reproductive rights, equal pay. Child sexual abuse, and in later years, issues like um, suicide. All of those issues were not coming from crazy feminist nuts. All of those issues were coming from a very deep engagement with our members who were saying that these were the issues that impacted on their lives. And these were the issues, apart from the poverty and the low pay and the, and the need for better terms and conditions, these were the issues they needed dealt with. Um, to the credit of the trade union movement, eventually those became core policy. And in some cases, such as the uh, national statutory minimum wage, um, was adopted by the Irish Congress of Trade Unions long before it was adopted by the TUC. But there were two issues in the early 80s um, that we were definitely on the, on the same page as the, the main leadership of the trade union movement. Um, and the first was the McBride principles, a set of um, positive action, a uh, little positive action program designed to uh, ensure that inward investment in Northern Ireland um, would have tied to it uh, the necessity for a bit of fairness in the employment of predominantly Catholics who were predominantly missing from the workforce. Oh, that was like lighting the blue touch paper and standing back. In the last few uh, weeks, papers around the McBride era, era have started to uh, come out. Um, we've seen how much money was being expended by the UK government to brief against the McBride pr principles in the USA. The McBride principles um, had one particular signature, signatory um, who was embraced by the US trade union movement, and that was my colleague, Ines McCormick and she went on a mission, um, a very grueling time in her life, going to state after state in the US, where state after state adopted the McBride principles and said, yeah, um, it's fair enough. We're gonna give money over there, then we wanna see a wee bit of uh, fairness. On this island and on the other island, hysteria. Hysteria, accused of all sorts, accused of a divestment program instead of a positive action program to try and challenge one of the, one of the issues that was a you know, bit of a driver in the conflict in the first place. The other, the other um, like the blue touch paper and stand back, was the proposal that the trade union movement itself would make some formal space for women at the top. Oh dear. That was highly controversial and that took several years, but eventually that one got through. When you look back on that in the year 2023, you think we couldn't possibly have been arguing about those things, but we were. We were. And in arguing about those things, we were missing the point that these were all pretty fundamental to the kind of society that we were trying to survive in, that we were trying to get our members to engage in, in the North, and that the issues we were dealing with were issues of equality, and fundamental human rights that were highly contested. But we could never have had any of those issues placed on the agenda of the Irish trade union movement without their consent. So a key part of the work we engaged in as a contribution to the peace process was that direct dialogue, particularly with members who thought that if you accorded that right to them, then we lose one. Or we don't see why these people are unhappy and require this as a right, and what is all this equality stuff about anyway? And I have to say, I'm very proud of the fact that we have brought forth over the last 35 to 40 years some stunning um, local union representatives from some of the most disadvantaged communities, 
from both sides of the divide, um, who've also moved beyond themselves and um, deepened their understanding of why we really need a peace process to work, um, and broadened their horizons and do things like support the rights of the Palestinian people. In a place where that's, that's contested. In a place where that's contested, unbelievably. Because in my part of the world, if one group of people supports an issue, the other group of people likes to take a different and, and uh, opposing view. But all of, all, of this, all of this work in the 80s and through to the 90s was, I suppose, making a contribution to what eventually would become a peace process without ever shouting about it because we did not distinguish between the lives of our members in the workplace and the lives of our members in their communities and their families. And we saw our union and still do today as an agent for social change. Now we had some fortunate happenings along the way um, in 19, well, I do, I'll share this, 1984, there, there, were, there were questions about what was the role of the British trade union movement, and there we were, a tiny bit of part of that. Although, to be fair to our union, they respected the Irish Sea, great border there, left us alone. And in terms of um, the British trade union movement, they would take very definitive positions on Ireland. Very definitive positions. I'm not objecting, some of them might have been the right decisions, but what they singularly lacked was direct engagement with the people who lived here. In 1984, at a big meeting in London, two of my heroes were on the pl platform debating where we might take this peace process. Could there be a peace process where we might take it forward? One was Maddie Marigan Sr. and the other was Inus McCormick. And they came out with complex, thoughtful, potential solutions that would move the issue forward. And I sat there while the British Labour and Trade Union movement represented in the room, and in particular the far left, stood up one after another and told them where they were going wrong, told them that this was entirely the wrong solution, that they had the solution, the Holy Grail was theirs, and then proceeded to argue with each other, faction after faction, about who actually had the Holy Grail. And we decided at that stage, let's not expend too much energy on the British trade union movement. Let's expend the energy on the people we represent at home, because if there's going to be a pro peace process, it is the people who will build it. Mitchell said the same thing all those years later, that an agreement was reached, but if there was going to be a real peace process, it would be built day by day, small steps taken by ordinary men and women. And there's a history that's not yet written. The history of the working class in the North from whatever quarter they come from. The history of working class women. The history of um, how they came together inside our union and inside our movement. I know that for many, many years, the people we represented left their own personal politics outside the door. The price they paid for being together, the price they paid for organizing together. And they only declared their positions in 1998 when we had to have that difficult conversation, do we support this agreement or do we not? And that was a difficult conversation for many people. And we eventually arrived at the conclusion we support this agreement. Furthermore, we will advocate support, and I'll tell you what, we will write to every single member we have, and we will set out the reasons for advocating support, and we will say to those who do not support it, that's all right. You are entitled, but you'll still have a place in our union. You'll still be part of our family. And that, that, um, that kind of inclusion has been fundamental in the way in which we've tried to move forward in a peace process that has been starstruck so many times. So many times, one step forward, three steps back. One of the ways I measure 
um, what has happened to us is um, health inequalities and the, the, the work that has been done on the health and well-being, mental and physical of the people of Northern Ireland. One of the earliest reports in 1990 indicated that the conflict had had a serious impact, but also said you've got to go back before then and you've got to look at deprivation, you've got to look at discrimination, and that's having, that you, what you're seeing now is the impact of that. A um, couple of years after the peace agreement was signed, a report was produced by the University of Ulster and these days known as the Ulster University. And uh, that report indicated that we had the highest levels of post-traumatic stress disorder um, in Europe, uh, higher than USA and in fact higher than some of the societies that were themselves emerging from conflict. Nothing was done about that. Fast forward to 2012. The chief medical officer, the government representative in the North himself produces a report that tells us that premature death and life expectancy has worsened for the people who are, have been most impacted by the conflict and who are in the areas of greatest deprivation or disadvantage. Fast forward to today and those stats are even worse. Now, if ever you wanted to know how successful our peace process for most people in the North is, there's an indicator. If you're 25 years old, we call you a peace baby. And 25 years ago, our aspiration was that you would not live the same life we did, that you would have a better life and you would have really good opportunities. And they would be based in the development and advancement of two of the best socialist models we've ever had, the National Health Service and the Welfare State. Constantly, those two models have been under attack. Those 25-year-olds have not universally enjoyed a better life than we did, and those 25-year-olds are now having children of their own. So there's another generation that we had hopes for with our peace process. There is a long way to go. I come back to the present day and the fact that we are now suffering the collective punishment from the British government, um, stood at Queen's University, and they said, oh God, we love this peace agreement, we really support you, be in no doubt we support you, and then it cut our budget and plunged our people deeper into poverty, took food out of the mouths of our children, cancelled the a holiday hunger programmes, no investment in our health service, which is on its knees, and major cuts to our education services. And uh, thank you, well done, happy 25th birthday peace agreement, says the UK government. So, you know, um, we have a long way to go. There are histories to be written, but the history of working class people, particularly women, particularly those engaged in their unions, and how they broke barriers down over the last 35 years, and how feminism influenced all of that has yet to be written. One of the most monumental contributions post the signing of that peace agreement, I think, came from um, McKittrick, Feeney, um, Kelters, and Johnson, is it? Uh, and that's the, no, Thompson, it's the, 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 the book Lost Lives, which catalogued at that point in time every man, woman, and child who'd been killed in the conflict. And victims groups, survivors groups said, this is extraordinary, this is really important, this could be the start of a process of healing. Um, but of course, we were made promises in the peace agreement that there would indeed be. A, a, a process for dealing with the legacy of the past, and that would include uh, a process of, of um, truth and reconciliation. But all of the, you know, the, the guarantor of the peace agreement, the main guarantor and the one that holds the purse strings is a liar. Uh, principally responsible for everything that has happened to us for a very long number of centuries. And, it's not serious today about our peace process. And there's no point beating around the bush 
And the Irish government, well, they forgot about us for about a decade in the middle of our peace process. They forgot. They forgot because they had bigger fish to fry. Everybody will always be paying more attention um, to their own electoral prospects than they will to being a guarantor of a peace agreement. Um, I may sound very cynical, but we've lived through this and we still live through it. But we're terribly hopeful. We're terribly hopeful that we have such a strong foundation. Um, we have such a strong union, uh, so, such a strong group of people who are prepared to work with each other, who have many said, if it were not for the union, I would have done 17 years for killing, you know, but I got involved in the union instead. I'm very proud of all of those achievements. But there is um, a big problem facing us at the minute, and that is uh, a government that has been in office less than it has been absent. And there is no plan B in the Good Friday Agreement. It is remarkable how many people, when Brexit became a reality, who didn't read the bit of the Good Friday Agreement that said, one of the things we're all signing up to is potential constitutional settlement mechanism for the future. Suddenly they found that there was one in it. We all knew that. We all knew that in 1978. There's a potential mechanism, or, uh, sorry, uh, uh, 98. There's a potential mechanism for securing the future of the island. And this is a dialogue that the Irish Congress of Trade Unions has recently said, we're going to take part in that dialogue. And in the North, we now have unionists starting to take part in that dialogue. And that is, you know, we can't stay the way we are. So what's the future going to look like? Um, let's have a, an honest debate around that. And that's the place where we are now. And I hope that becomes an honest debate and not a, bait, uh, a debate that is um, shaped by political prejudices of the past, and particularly not a debate that is shaped by political prejudices on this side of the border. God knows we have enough of our own. What we need from the people on this side of the border is the support, you know, the 94% the uh, support that you gave us in that peace agreement. We need that support for a conversation about what the future might look like, um, because there's no point um, signing up to a peace agreement um, unless you're prepared to sign up to all the people involved in that agreement, and that includes us in the six counties as well. Thank you. Someone's watching you. Is that yours, Patricia? Patricia? No? Sorry, good, e good evening, everybody. Uh, there was a watch here. I was just wondering whose it was. Um, it's good to be here. Can I just maybe start by acknowledging the contribution given by my colleague, Patricia? Uh, I'm not going to try to say the stuff that she's talked about on the Good Friday Agreement, because I've heard it before. I've heard Patricia speaking before, and she's excellent. And of course, she lives it every day. And uh, it's always a difficult situation for trade unions particularly who operate in Northern Ireland, like our own union operates there too, and it is very difficult. So I just want to acknowledge that petition and thank you for your contribution. Can I just also, when I have the opportunity, to congratulate the Labour History Society on its 50th anniversary. Unfortunately, I won't be here for the 100th. I would like to be, but I won't make it. But uh, it is an exceptional conference. It's well run, and I want to acknowledge the people who have organised it and the work they have done to put it together. It's really, really good. Uh, and you know, the likes of Jack and Shay and Francis and all the other people, you've done a really good job, so thank you very much. Just talking about the, the subjects, and as, as Patricia said, there's a number of issues that you want to talk about. I'm going to concentrate a little bit more on the Brexit element of the discussion and how, the impact of, how it impacts on the Good Friday Agreement, and maybe a little bit about where we stand now in the trade union movement and where we might make history into the future. Well, my involvement with Brexit within SIP2, I am responsible for the private sector in SIP2, which is around 100,000 members. So we have membership right across the private sector in all of the sectors. So you can imagine that Brexit was going to be a huge issue for SIP2. Now, I was asked 
in 2015 to speak at a conference organized by the Charter Group. As you know, it's a trade union think tank that supports the EU. Um, I can't think of the name of the, the chair of it now. Uh, I'll think of it. Uh, but anyway, he asked me to speak at this and what the likely impact was going to be on um, SIP 2s, particularly our manufacturing industry and our food industry. So I had to go off and do a bit of research. And I learned a lot of things while doing that research. And remember, this is 2015, which is a year before the actual referendum took place. And what I found out was, number one, that the UK is, is not and never was, well, it was, but certainly in 2016, wasn't our biggest trading partner. And in fact, it was our fourth biggest trading partner. The EU, the US, and Belgium, believe it or not, was, was far bigger. Uh, and the UK was in around 12% of our exports went to the UK. But most importantly, we have our second biggest industry in Ireland is our agriculture and food industry. And that industry is, well, it's our, our second one. The biggest one is, is pharmaceuticals. It is our most important industry. It's indigenous and it creates employment throughout all of the counties, throughout all of this country. You could just, all of you who live out the country, you'll see all the factories that milk and takes, and all that takes place right across the country. So it's very, very important. And it's, it creates huge amounts of employment, far more than it's created in the pharmaceutical industry. So the other part of the research we had to do is what, what impact would it have in Ireland? How, how would it impact on us if we ended up with a hard Brexit, i.e. that they would leave the EU without doing some kind of an agreement? And what we, what we found was that the percentages uh, of impact depended on our exposure to the UK market. Obviously, as I said, agriculture and food was the biggest one. And if you take agriculture and food, for an example, you take all the, the dairy companies. The milk trucks cross over across the border maybe 100 times a day. They transfer milk from one plant in the north to the south and vice versa. Pigs are slaughtered in the north, they're sla slaughtered in the south. They move them across the border as and when required. <coughs> So if you ended up with a hard border at customs between the north and the south, it was going to create huge problems for producers and particularly for our industries. Our exports to the, to the, to the UK were going to be very badly affected. And from our perspective in SIP2, it would have had a huge impact on our membership within those industries. We had supply chain issues. The UK was a land bridge between the Republic and Europe in order to transport our products to the EU, which was our biggest market. That was going to be another problem. And then the third problem, of course, was going to be the impact on the Good Friday Agreement and how that was going to impact on the citizens in the north and citizens in the south. So we, we had to deal with this situation. And as it developed, and within SIP2, Brexit is on our agenda at every executive meeting, and unfortunately, I'm the one that does have to report on it. Every month, I have to give some update on where Brexit is, and sometimes there's nothing happening, and then sometimes there's a whole load of stuff that's happening. Now, just, we have to ask yourself, what was the purpose of Brexit in the first place? Why did it happen? Well, there's a number of reasons why it happened. Well, one, you had a British government who was constantly being bombarded by those on the far right, those like the UKIP and so on, who were arguing that we should be taken out of Europe, that it was destroying the UK economy, it was uh, allowing for illegal immigration into the UK. And basically, they were forced into calling a referendum to put it to bed once and for all. There was an internal war within the Conservative Party for many years on the EU membership. Not that they had a very full membership because they were exempt from a whole load of parts of the, of the treaties and indeed there was a deal done with them just prior to the, the referendum taking place. So many of them thought, and the, the, the general feeling was that the referendum would pass, not for Brexit but against Brexit. That was the general feeling around the place. It's not something I would have agreed with because anybody who would have looked at what was happening in the UK at the time couldn't miss the level of racism, the level of 
uh, of all, all the stuff that was being put in the, the right-wing newspapers about immigrants and illegal immigrants and people coming in from all parts of the world to take the jobs of the English. And I, and I, I specifically say the English because they were the ones who ultimately led to Brexit taking place. As you know, Scotland, Northern Ireland vote against it. But in England, they in hordes, and very many working class people voted for that because every day of every week, all they've been kept told was, your jobs are gone, the EU is responsible. Every problem you have in the society, nothing to do with the Conservative Party, it's all to do with the EU. And many people bought that lie, and it was a lie, pure, unadulterated lies. Now, we also had some people on the left who supported it as well. Some trade unions on the left also supported it as well, thinking that they were going to have carbon elected, they were going to bring in all these new laws, throw out the Conservative anti-trade union laws, and everything was going to be rosy from there on in. That never happened. It was never going to happen. Simple as that. So once Brexit happened, 2016, most people were shocked that it had happened. And it was like what it reminds me of was like the old dog down at Country Lane that every time a tractor or a car passes by, he chases after the car. Run, 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 run. But suddenly one day, the dog catches the car. And he says, what am I going to do now? That was like what it was in the UK at the time. They simply didn't know what they were going to do. They were in shock. And for UKIP and those on the extreme right, it wasn't a great day for them either, although they seemed to get what they want, but their business, their livelihood, their life depended on staying in the EU and complaining about it and, and, and agitating to get out. So they then got it and didn't know what to do with it. So we then had all the negotiations taking place with the EU and we, we had this you know, attempt to have a free trade agreement and all this kind of stuff. And we were told, or the British people were told, that they had a ready-made agreement. Take it out of the oven, put it in here. Absolute bullshit. Absolute nuts, right? I'm not going to say what I was going to say about Boris Johnson, if it were being recorded anyway. But <laughs> Boris Johnson, at least he had a very simple message for the British people. And the message was, get it done. Three words, get it done. The Labour Party had about three paragraphs of what they wanted for uh, how to deal with Brexit. And by the way, what they had in those three paragraphs, what Jeremy, Jeremy Thorwood came up with, was actually very, very good if he had got into power and had implemented it. Because their view of the world was that we should have at least something that looks like the single market uh, and something that looks like all of the other elements of the EU agreements, which would allow for free trade to really happen between um, the EU and the UK. And the stupidity of a country leaving a block where they had their greatest and most single biggest market on their doorstep, where they depended on hundreds of thousands of EU workers to run their hotels, their shops, their hospitals, all of the jobs that they depended on in the UK. Absolute madness. So anyway, we had the election, we had Johnson in, and he calls up the Taoiseach one day. He was the Taoiseach then, I think he's back as Taoiseach now, Leo. And at that then, of course, he puts forward his proposition that we have a solution for the border issue uh, and they set it out. And basically it was that, you know, they, they would have an agreement to allow trade to happen between the EU and the UK. And it eventually came into this, um, came into the Northern Ireland Protocol, or the so-called Northern Ireland Protocol. And I just want to say this. We have the Northern Unionists, particularly the DUP and others, who are out every day blaming the Good Friday, sorry, blaming the, um, blaming 
the good, you know, Brexit, sorry, yeah, blaming Brexit for, for the cause of having to have the um, protocol in place. The truth of it is, it is Brexit that caused the need to have a protocol in the first place. And can I just say this from, from, from the perspective of the way we have looked at the impact economically in this country. If we didn't have a protocol, we would have serious trouble in terms of the economics and the impact on citizens across this island and the free movement of trade and the free movement of people. And uh, so, so when the, the, um, the agreement was complete, and of course what we had, I mean, it was, it was laughable if it wasn't so serious. You know, we had the, the minister for, effectively, the UK minister for Brexit heading over to the EU, doing the negotiations, coming back with an agreement and saying he didn't like the agreement, I wouldn't support it. The agreement that he had negotiated. Imagine being a trade union official and doing that. I mean, it's absolute, absolute nonsense. So where, where, where is it now? Well, we have a revised Northern Ireland Protocol, which, you know, we have the green lane and the red lane, which effectively means unfettered trade between the UK and Northern Ireland, and unfettered trade from Northern Ireland to the EU. I mean, it's a perfect situation. If you ask any of the business people in the North, they will tell you it's the perfect situation for them because they've trade everywhere, right? And we even had Richie Sunak saying, look at what you have now up the North, haven't you? It's a great system. They all had the great system and they threw it away, including him, by the way. So, when, when, uh, when this system is in place, you have the green lane, which allows for products that are produced in the UK to go into the north. The red lane is if they move across out of, out of Ireland and across the EU, which, which, which makes sense. And uh, th this, this protocol now helps us. And of course, we now have the DUP and those on the extreme right who are opposed to the protocol. And they're opposed to it on the basis that it is in breach of the Good Friday Agreement. I mean, the nonsense that they're saying it's in breach of the Good Friday Agreement, given that they were the ones who voted against it, voted against in the referendum for the Good Friday Agreement, and voted in the Parliament, in the UK Parliament, against all of the protocols. It's absolute. I don't know, sometimes I wonder. But here's the thing, and you ask yourself, why is it important to the British Conservative Party? given that it's the party of business, that the party of the rich, and given the absolute catastrophe that it has been on the UK economy since Brexit, not since 2016, but since Brexit. I watched a programme the other night on TV, and it showed that in the UK, if you look at the people on the lowest income, they have lost 5.5% of their income since Brexit not since 2016, but since Brexit. But the top income earners, the top income in the UK, have increased their wealth by 7.5%. Now, in all circumstances, when you have a crisis that takes place, like we had the financial crisis, we had COVID, the people, the working people, are the ones who suffer most, and those who have the money and who have rich and who have property are the ones who gain most. And this is exactly what has happened in the UK. So... The reality is, is that the poor are paying the price for Brexit. That is a fact. And I think as Patricia has set out of her knowledge of what's happening in the north, with the services and the health and, and so on. And that is going to continue. Indeed, we have the great leader of, of UKIP, I don't even mention his name, who, you know, who is now saying Brexit hasn't worked. Of course it hasn't worked. It was never going to work. No sensible economist, no person who understood anything about economics could say that it was going to work. Now, whatever issues we might have with the EU, and we have quite a few of them, but I'd sooner have them on my side than the Conservative Party. No doubt about that. So, where are we today? Patricia mentioned in her contribution about the Good Friday Agreement and the provision in that Good Friday Agreement for a referendum and that referendum is to to see whether or not the people 
in the north and the south, uh, would agree to the island uniting again. And Patricia also mentioned about Congress's position on that, and that I think is very important. And that's the position we are in today, and it's the position I think will make history into the future. And somebody will be standing here at some stage in the future talking about the trade union's involvement in this change in the future. Congress, in its Belfast conference about three years ago, passed a very important motion, and that motion committed the trade union movement to engage with the future of Ireland. Now, the motion was very carefully crafted. The motion, first of all, uh, re, 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 reaffirms our commitment to the Good Friday Agreement. It, uh, it reaffirms the, or not reaffirms, it, it deals with uh, the, the acknowledgement that within the Good Friday Agreement there is a requirement at some stage for a, referen a referendum. Now it's my own belief, I know Leo Varaka said he expects to see a United Ireland within his lifetime. I don't wish the man ill, but I hope it's within my lifetime, which will be much shorter. But, but the, the third and most important part of that motion it was about the trade union's uh, engagement and its seeking of the no going back policy that the union adopted following COVID. And effectively, not going into that, I wouldn't have time to go into that, but effectively what it's saying is, is that we are not prepared as a trade union movement to accept what we have had in the north and the south going forward in the event that we have a new Ireland. And we are effectively talking about having a new Ireland. And that's what we believe we should have. We do not want the old republic where we have the, the golden triangle and the tents and all the stuff that goes with it. Nor do we want the north as it is at the minute with its divisions and sectarianism. We want a new Ireland that's for the people of this country, but is worker led and that the trade union movement has a real say the facts are that since 1916, since the murder of James Connolly, who from this building or the previous building here, walked out in 1916 with the Irish Citizens Army and gave his life for this country, the trade union movement has abstented itself from the discussions on the national question. That is a fact, the first shot of the, of the War of Independence, and we didn't hear any more from the trade union movement up until now. That is a fact, we can't deny it. We want to be engaged fully in a new Ireland. And it's my intention, I know it's Patricia's intention, we sit on the North-South group, North-South North -South body in Congress, with the intention of all the unions have a common position with regard to how we deal with the possibility of a referendum and what this new Ireland should look like. It's no threat to anybody, or at least it shouldn't be a threat to anybody. What it will be is a new beginning for a country that needs a new beginning and puts the history behind us that we should, that we should put behind us. So listen, I'm going to leave it at that. Uh, I hope, as I said, that at some stage in the future there will be a debate about this issue and the issues that I've talked about will have come to pass and that we will have the trade union movement engagement and hopefully we will have a united Ireland as well. Thank you very much. Some of you may have a few questions. Uh, I'd be obliged if you try to keep the questions very, very brief or the observations. I've mentioned that earlier, but uh, we've uh, about 15 minutes, so the, 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 the briefer the questions, the more that we can, uh, we can, uh, we can uh, get into. Okay, uh, any questions? There's, uh, there's no questions. It's, uh, oh. <laughs> yeah, fire away. Oh, yeah. 
Thank you. Thank you both very much, John Horn, uh, Emeritus CCD. Uh, uh, really stimulating um, on the past and also future looking, future gazing. So if you had to design in the new island that you've just been talking about, um, the trade union structure that you think would be most appropriate, what would it look like? Uh, well, uh, well, I think I, I mentioned in my presentation, Congress has done a very comprehensive policy document called No Going Back. And I would suggest that anybody who's into that stuff reads the document. It covers every aspect of social, economic uh, policies right across both North and South, it doesn't exclude anything. And it sets out the argument for having a you know, single health service, having a single education system, all of that stuff is included in it. So as I said, you know, to go through it would be, would be too long, but generally speaking, that's what we're talking about. Yeah, indeed it would. Um, Absolutes for me, it would have to have a national health service, taxation based, and a proper welfare uh, system on the island. But um, I have always been worried, I was al I've always been worried that um, there may be reunification on this island um, as a consequence of capitalism, as opposed to um, a reshaping of the island in the face of the, in, in the models the trade union movement wants it would have to look very different from both parts of this island. One of the masters in, on the planet of um, colonization, you know, occupation, colonization, and all of that to the UK. Um, when it divided the island, I've often thought they're, they're, they're great ones for leaving behind people who will police their own occupation. I'm not sure which side of the island they left them on. And that's the truth. You want to respond to that? We have, a, we have a trade union movement that is unique in Europe in that we have one single Congress covering two jurisdictions. And if you look at anywhere else in Europe, you will find a minimum two, three trade union Congresses, usually um, born out of political differences a century ago, right? So. We've already got one movement. Now, it doesn't operate um, uh, effectively as it should on a north-south basis. We've got two bits. Um, the bit uh, called the Northern Iron Committee of the Irish Congress of Trade Unions um, was an accommodation to the Ulster Unionists who ran the place way back. And to this day, the DUP have a problem meeting a thing called the Irish Congress of Trade Unions. Um, but it would be, it would be, in my view, um, somewhat different from today's because I, I do see more mergers, I see more developments, I'd like to see more north-south, I'd like one or two unions to have secession rules in their rule book so that they could let their people go. <laughs> there, there will be changes, um, and I could see it as a much bigger, much more organised, 10 times the size it is now, but with a smaller number of unions and a lot more cooperation. Um, not something based on um, competition, but something based on the concept that the trade union movement itself is an agent for social change. I also would expect it to take a very clear role in a lot of decisions about how that country is run. John Martin, I was at the, the, uh, the Desmond Graves uh, yearly school a couple of weeks ago, and we had a, a same conversation on the Good Friday Agreement, North-South, and the coming situation for a united Ireland. And one of the speakers, and absolutely uh, uh, the lady herself, was, was brilliant. She certainly made her points and made her points known. She said, if we are talking about a, a united Ireland, not, let's not talk about a Catholic or Protestant. Let's talk about the people. You know, she said, we'll have to leave all, all that behind. So I think if we're going in, as we are going in and 
the genital election next year in Ireland will define that that is going to happen. And we know the party that will be part of that government that will certainly initiate that from the south very, very, very quickly. But I would like to see a situation that if we're talking about a united Ireland, I wouldn't use the terminology of a, a, a united Ireland. I would argue for a new Ireland based on social justice for all, north and south, in the 32 counties. Yes. Yeah, Ant Smith. Sorry, I'll just get two questions yeah. in. And, uh, go ahead, Ant. come together to form um, a campaign um, and that campaign argues for a new and united Ireland and there is a manifesto and uh, the membership is drawn from across the 32 counties and any of you who are active in your unions or in your professional organizations, academic organizations, we'd be very happy to come and speak to you uh, about that. I also just want to encourage those in the audience to pick up the challenge from Patricia to not to stand back from this debate and to remember that there's a whole, there are generations and there is a whole community of people who earnestly want that debate to develop. I'm talking about the nationalist people uh, uh, of the North, and I think it's important that we defend the intervention from Leo Varadkar, which I don't normally usually do, to say that it's a legitimate debate, and he has stood against um, Heaton Harris, the Secretary of State, who, by the way, is refusing to respond to legitimate demands of working people, unionists and nationalists, to have a pay increase. And watch out for next week, we'll be on strike in our thousands across the health service. But I think it's important that those who are influencers and contributors, activists, academics, uh, no matter what your party affiliations are, support the stand that Varadkar has taken, that it is legitimate. Uh, we have a right, those of us who would like to see uh, in New Ireland to speak out and uh, this and the media is picking it up it is worrying that you know we must not upset those who don't agree and we mustn't frighten the horses now I think it's about time we got past that and um, I welcome the Irish trade union movement's commitment to facilitate that debate and everybody in this room should do everything we can to support that debate and to participate and support the trade union movement taking that step forward because it will be historic as Jerry has said. Thanks. Yeah, can, I, can, can I just respond just to the, the first point and I, I agree with everything that Anne Speed has said there. Um, remember when the referendum takes place, before the referendum takes place, the government, the Irish government must have a set of policies as to how the EU Ireland will look after the referendum should it pass. And that's the key part that we want to get involved in, that we have to have a say at that point. And what we're asking for, and what I believe we should have, is we should have this issue dealt with through the Citizens' Assembly. That's where it needs to go, where there's going to be a broad uh, view from the citizens of this country to have a look at this issue and to see what it is a new Ireland should look like. I don't think anybody in this room would disagree that our health service is in tatters. It's the same up the north now at the moment. You know, our health service, our, our, our social services, all of those things need to change. And, and somebody asked, what kind of a, a country do we want? What, what should it look like from a trade union perspective? My own view, we should have a social democratic basis to it, or so, a democratic socialist. I know that's a very broad range across all the various spectrums, but those of you who are on the left will understand what I'm, what I'm trying to say, that the basis of our country is social democratic, not a government, but the basis of something like the Nordic countries, for example, where the citizens and the people are put first before capital. 
Um, we've obviously got some experience in my union of what happened with our Scottish region. Um, most recently in their referendum, they, the line they took was to um, develop um, the model that they wanted for the future and then to challenge the um, uh, both sides of the argument, independence or, or, or stay with the union, to challenge those two uh, camps on um, how they measured up in their vision to what the union's vision was. And that union vision was created out of people, whether they were pro or, um, uh, or, or against independence, drawing up the model of the ideal that they would want to live in. I think it is incumbent on us to do that because if the trade union movement doesn't do things like this, we are decades behind the employers' organisations on this island who um, jumped at the point of a peace agreement to do all their work on cross-border mobility um, and all the, uh, all the mechanisms that would need to be put in place um, for capitalism to get on with its business. And when the, um, uh, the Brexit um, referendum, just before the referendum, the EU produced an impact assessment, uh, on the impact on the island, and 37 different areas of north-south cooperation. Now, 37 different areas in areas like um, energy and uh, agriculture and places like that, but very, very little input from our movement. And there has been very little input from our movement on anything that has been about cross-border mobility or um, uh, the 25 years of north-south bodies that have been working on um, lots of areas of cross-border work. Um, if we were in Scotland, we'd be in there. We would be in there um, not only um, advocating, we'd be in there taking decisions. Uh, it's, um, it's time's up, I'm afraid. Uh, it was a very stimulating, uh, very insightful uh, contribution, and I think uh, a round of applause would be appropriate.